So uh, thank you all for, uh, we, we've got until uh, noon for this, um, so we're going to get going now. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming today, the WTIA. Uh, for those of you that are not super familiar, I know some of you are sort of cursorily familiar with us. Uh, the WTIA is a nonprofit co-op of a thousand technology companies here in the state of Washington. Uh, we create programs that leverage the power that that collection of companies can um, create by combining their, their influence and their resources. Uh, this webinar um, is free and it's one of those programs that uh, is possible because of member companies that we have. Um, and our webinar today is the first in an entire series of webinars that are gonna help you figure out how to manage your business through the current COVID dilemma and hopefully soon restart to thrive in a post-COVID world. So um, WTIA is a nonprofit um, and this webinar takes staff to organize and it costs money to produce because technology isn't free, even for nonprofits. Um, and all that stuff is made possible by the generous contributions of member companies of the WTIA. And uh, today I wanna highlight one of those companies. So I wanna uh, welcome Rodrigo Lopez, who is the regional senior vice president uh, at Comcast uh, to kick us off. Michael, thank you so much for having me here today. You know, we at Comcast understand uh, these are challenging and uncertain times for all companies in our state. And I am based here in, in Washington. I'm here in uh, Linwood office today. But, uh, you know, for those that don't know, we have over 4,000 employees here in the area. We support over 1.6 million residential and, and business customers. So, you know, what, what's happening today is so important and it's so critical for us to, to stay connected. We recognize the role, you know, the WTIA and its members play in our economy and in our communities. And we're so excited to be able to partner with you and support our fellow uh, tech companies and tech businesses in the area to make programs like this happen. I'm incredibly excited to hear from Congressman Kilmer. Great that he's gonna be able to speak to us today and I'm eager to learn as well as uh, I'm sure all of you are, you know, on, on, from this town hall today. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Rodrigo, appreciate it. Um... So uh, before we uh, start the conversation with Congressman Kilmer, uh, just one quick note to everyone participating um, in this event today. This webinar has a few options for you to engage and we'll make those clear as we proceed. But the one that I wanna point out right now is a, a main feature. Um, at the uh, bottom of your screen, you will see a hand um, that you can raise when it comes time for Q&A. Uh, but between now and Q&A, you may be thinking of things that you really want the answer to. You may be thinking of something like, ah, oh, I wish I could ask, ask this question as uh, Congressman Kilmer and I are going through a conversation uh, about uh, today's topics. Uh, please just write those down in the Q&A um, button down at the bottom. So at the bottom, you will see a Q&A with the thing that looks like bubbles. Click that button and you'll be able to type in your questions. My colleagues, Callie and uh, Ian, are gonna help me make sure that uh, we address every one of your questions wherever that seems to be the most appropriate as we go through this. Um, so go ahead and type your questions whenever you have those. Um, so first, uh, Congressman Kilmer, I just wanna thank you so much for taking time to speak to us today. Um, we really appreciate the extra effort that you give uh, for this, um, uh, given the, everything you have on your plate right now, serving your district on the peninsula. Um, so first, thank you very much um, for coming today. You bet. I'm glad um, to be with you. Um, so first, first and foremost, on just on a personal level, how has COVID affected your family? Well, um, I'm uh, joining you from my dining room table. Uh, my coworkers are now a 10-year-old, a 14-year-old, and an Australian shepherd who you might uh, might have heard bark as we were ramping up. So, um, uh, you know, and um, it's obviously very disruptive. Um, I've got a fifth grader who's bummed that she can't complete elementary school and an eighth grader who's bummed that she can't complete middle school and say goodbye and thank you to her teachers. Um, you know, I have uh, parents that I haven't seen since this started because they're in a high risk category. And I think like a lot of people, we're just trying to navigate uh, these circumstances in a way that keep people safe. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, it's, affected, it's affected everybody um, and I'm, um, um, again, grateful that you're taking the time to yeah, be with us today. So from what you've seen, I'm curious, just sort of at, at the very top, there's like the first, first and foremost in my mind, uh, m many of us uh, in the business community have a perspective that there's this highly fragmented political set of priorities that seem to go nowhere. 
um, in Washington, D.C. And I'm curious, has the pandemic, has it shifted the political priorities in D.C.? Well, uh, I think you saw in the response to the pandemic, um, for the most part, the ability to come together faster on something that was significant and comprehensive than one would have expected based on the um, low performance of Congress in, in prior years. You saw three legislative packages, all of which passed with broad bipartisan support. Um, in, you know, I think what you've seen over the course of the last month and a half is just a repetition of the scene from Jaws where Brody says, we're going to need a bigger boat. Um, you know, each package has sort of increased in responding to this open scale of this crisis. Um, obviously, right now, there's some friction specifically with regard to the need for a bigger boat for the Small Business Administration uh, programs. Uh, funding for hospitals as well. I talked to a hospital in my district where they're concerned about making payroll this month. So uh, more resources are going to be needed. And my hope is for fast action uh, from Congress uh, to address that. Yeah. Um, and we'll, we'll get to what that might look like in a minute because um, the rumors are flying around about timing and what it is or what it isn't and so on. Um, but before we get to that, let's just talk for a little bit about CARE specifically, because most of the news is really centered on the CARES Act. Um, and I actually, I tried scanning the thing. It's just a long, awful, long and complicated document. Um, and there, there, there's still some confusion even now, despite the fact that some of it's actually rolling out about how employers and employees get access to their portion of the stimulus packages one, two, and three. So I just want to like do a couple of these one at a time. And again, uh, for those of you that are participating, if, if questions come up as a result of this, like just go ahead and type those in there and we'll try to try to nail these. Um, so I know a few people who I've actually personally know of a few people that got their $1,200 tax rebate. So that seems to be rolling out, but it seems also from most people that I've talked to, it's rolling out slower than many expected. So just to be clear, how do people actually get their tax rebate? Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, the IRS began sending um, the rebate payments on on Wednesday of this week. The answer to that, um, the short answer is it depends. Uh, it depends on whether you gave the IRS your direct deposit information when you filed uh, your federal tax returns either in 2018 or 2019. If you did provide direct deposit information um, for your tax return, the IRS will use that information to automatically deposit your stimulus check into your bank account. And many of the, to your point, many of the economic impact uh, payments, um, which is the official term for them, were deposited on Wednesday. Uh, you should keep an eye out for those funds in your account, or you can check the status of your rebate. Um, the IRS has set up a, 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 a link um, uh, on their website, uh, which um, which is just irs.gov, and I think on the main page you can find it's coronavirus get my payment. Um, if you didn't provide your direct deposit information with your 2018 or 2019 tax return, the IRS will send you a paper check in the mail. That'll take longer than the direct deposit uh, to reach you. Um, if that's the case for you, you can also visit the IRS website and um, uh, learn more about how to file online to receive your payment. Um, either to provide, to make sure that they have the right address for you on file or to be able to fill in direct deposit information. So that, like there's a, there's so much mobility in this country. There are a lot of people that have moved since they filed their taxes last year. And so if they moved addresses or, and didn't do it electronically, then there's this whole issue of like, where's the check actually going to be mailed and so on. So there it sounds like the, the way to solve that is to send them to the IRS website. Yeah, I can put into, that. I'll put into the chat uh, some of these links. So that was for the non-filers. And then let me give you the, if you want to check the status of your payment, it's the second link I'm putting in. Oops, Michael, I can't hear you anymore. Oops, sorry. Here we go. Um, I was just Cutting out the uh, the sawing background noise. We've got some construction going on at the office, which is why I'm actually at the office because there's a bunch of work going on here to stop a roof from leaking. <laughs> um, 
fortunately, we haven't had any rain here in Seattle in the last week, so it's not been such a problem, but it's been, it's been an issue. Anyway, um, so the, the $1,200 dollars is coming um, one way or the other. And now I've heard that the actual calculation is it's actually sort of an advance on a 2020 tax, which has yet to be filed, which so April 15th, 2020. Um, and I've had it explained to me that, um, that your eligibility is actually based on your income at that time, not in the past. And so first of all, is that correct? And second of all, is there some sort of like clawback or reconciliation for people that ended up making more money next year than they did last year? Um, so the, the, the rebate payments in broad brush strokes are $1,200. Um, uh, and then they start to phase out um, at incomes above $75,000. And then they phase out entirely, I think at $98,000. Um, oh, uh, right. Or 99, yeah, excuse me. And then you double it for a married family. And then $500 uh, for, for a kid. Um, uh, I will have to, um, I can try to look as we're talking to see if I can answer the um, specific question that you just raised there. I'm not sure if, uh, if I know. I've had some people ask me like, you know, okay, so they only made 65 last year, but now they're fortunate and they have a, I don't know, $80,000 job this year. And so when they file their taxes next year, if they got $1,200, but they were only eligible for, I don't know, $800, whatever it is, is there going to be a, a, a payback? You know, that's really the question. And yeah, the, I mean, the, the, uh, the benefit, and this may not be directly responsive to your question, but the, the, the cash rebate is, um, uh, uh, is, um, is run through the IRS almost like uh, any other tax credit. Um, and that was done simply to try to get dollars out the door faster. Yeah, okay. So there's a potential of a reconciliation next year. Right, so um, it seems like the $600 per week supplemental federal unemployment benefit for those, um, for those of the businesses that are unfortunately having had to furlough or lay off employees. Um, it seems like the $600 a week supplemental federal unemployment benefit gets routed through the states. And in our case, that would be ESD run by Director Levine. So yeah. it seems like our employees simply follow one step, apply to the state, and then they get the state unemployment plus the federal benefit in one process. Is that correct? Yeah. The, the, um, so uh, according to the Washington State Employment Security Department, anyone who believes that they may be eligible for pandemic unemployment insurance should wait to apply until April 18th. Um, they've been wor working to get the system up and ready to roll. Um, they've been working around the clock. We had a, a Facebook Live with Director Levine um, a few days ago. You can find it on my Facebook and we kind of went through some yeah. of the most frequently asked questions. Yeah. Um, but one of the key ones was, hey, I just lost my job because of this. How do I get my benefit? And the answer was apply on, you know, on or after April 18th. Um, uh, I will also put into, um, uh, into the chat uh, details, both for an employee and for an employer uh, yeah. to uh, learn about uh, access to the um, to those benefits. Um, there are some um, some changes that were made. So to to your point, you know, historic. Not only was there an additional six hundred dollars added to the benefit, and some folks have asked, so why is that? Um, part of this is traditionally unemployment assistance is not designed to be full wage replacement because we want able-bodied people to go pound the pavement to find another job. Um, right now, you know, certainly if someone can find another job after being laid off, that's good. And, and you know, um, employment security and encourages that. But we really don't want people um, walking the streets, knocking on doors for employment. Um, we want folks to stay home and stay healthy. And uh, so, that's part of the rationale behind these additional resources being um, being brought to bear. On top of that, no waiting, no waiting weeks, so that dollars begin to flow um, once uh, someone is approved. 
in this instance, and I know folks might have questions about it, they're going to, you know, in essence, um, provide back pay if you've been wait if you've been unemployed and waiting uh, to be able to get the funds that you're eligible for. And perhaps most importantly, under this pandemic unemployment assistance program, folks who were previously not eligible for unemployment assistance, folks like independent uh, contractors and sole proprietors, uh, gig workers are now eligible for this new type of unemployment assistance. Yeah, I, I just heard some clarification from the director this morning that um, if you're a gig worker, like a you know like in particular if you're in the TNC world, and um, it's it's not super clear to ESD exactly how much your wages were, and there isn't any clarity on that uh, due to the way that the old, the current mechanism is for filing all of this stuff. You're going to get the minimum, and then when it finally the deck the dust clears on all that, whatever they still owe you, they'll pay, they'll pay retroactively, which is great news. Related to that, there are some employers like um, someone named Tamara just asked this question: is they've had to cut back employees, and they've cut back on that uh, back in March. Um, and they have those folks go ahead and apply for unemployment immediately at that point in time. If it really is a 418 is the beginning that ESD starts, that that sounds to me like they're not going to get the f federal unemployment benefits until after that date. But the fact that they filed early doesn't mean that they're out of the, out of the loop, right? Um, what, what I would encourage is, um, is, uh, Individual circumstances just may differ by case. And so, yep. um, again, uh, um, folks can uh, uh, reach out to employment security, um, yep. um, find out what they are eligible for. Uh, Susie, when I did the Facebook Live with her, got some of those um, rather technical questions about, you know, yeah. if I'm already on unemployment, what does that mean? Right. Uh, as an example, you know, people are. Um, eligible for extended unemployment benefits, even if they were, so if they were already on unemployment uh, and now, you know, you have some folks who may be nearing exhaustion of benefit, they would be able to, um, uh, to get that extended benefit. Yeah. So uh, final question on this particular vector. Um, there's, there's been some rumor mill floating around uh, about this, this block of money that's being sent out to the states to supplement um, unemployment, state unemployment, um, there are so many people applying for it that we're gonna run out of money. Um, and so the question is, um, like, do, is, there any, is there any visibility into when that might happen? Will it run out of money? And if so, if it does run out of money at some point in time, what happens to those people who would have qualified, but they're like, is there more money coming? Like, how does that work? There's a lot of questions to unpack there, so let me, <laughs> let, let, let me do my best. Um, so in the CARES Act, $260 billion was included to um, expand uh, access to unemployment, as, mm -hmm. as you uh, um, uh, likely know. We've seen a massive increase in um, unemployment filings. Yeah. I was yeah. just on a, a Zoom call with the Jefferson County Chamber of Commerce and folks in Port Townsend. The week prior to this pandemic, there were 25 initial unemployment claims. In the four weeks since, there's been 2,500 unemployment, uh, initial unemployment claims. So uh, just a massive, massive uh, increase. And so part of the rationale for that funding that was provided in the CARES Act was um, to basically be a backstop to be able to provide federal support for, um, for those payments. Uh, you are already seeing some of the resources that were provided in the CARES Act uh, have proved inadequate in terms of overall funding amount. And so discussions are already underway about providing more funding for the SBA programs. Um, uh, in fact, negotiations are happening as we speak on uh, expanding the Paycheck Protection Program and the economic impact disaster loans and getting more money to those programs. There are, is also um, more money needed for our medical providers, for our hospitals that are on the front line of this because they've been both uh, seeing an uptick in their expenses as they try to respond to coronavirus and all of their elective procedures have been canceled. And um, so they're losing revenue uh, substantially. 
for sure. So okay. uh, let's let's go on to the PPP. Um, so it seems I, I happen to know because we're 501c6 um, and so closely tied to other 501c3s. I, I know some 501c3s that are already approved and, and actually know one 501c3 that actually got their money already. It's pretty amazing how quickly that went. Um, they, they fortunately had a relationship with an SBA lender uh, that was their banker to begin with. So that worked out really yeah. well. I've not heard of any other small business. Ballpark 8 million small to medium sized businesses, depending on your definition. And there's roughly one and a half million nonprofits in the US. So logistically, how does this money actually get through several hundred S7A load lenders? Like, like how's this, how's it going to work? Yeah, I agree. You know, I think businesses are right to be concerned about the ability of the system to help over, you know, seven and a half million eligible entities get access to this assistance. So, and, and I don't say that to take a shot at the SBA, um, you know, to the credit of the SBA and Treasury, they stood up this new program in a very short period of time from the passage of the CARES Act to PPP um, uh, implementation was about seven days and um, PPP checks getting out after 14 days to some businesses. You know, they are building the airplane while they're flying it. Um, having said that, there have been problems with uh, the implementation and some delays for far too many employers. Uh, you know, and, and listen, uh, I have um, extraordinary empathy for the folks who are going through this. I talked to a business owner yesterday who said, you know, I put 32 years of my life into building this business. I've got men and women who depend on me for a paycheck and I can't decide now whether I should hunker down and try to weather the storm or just throw in the towel. And, you know, that, uh, I think all of us sort of feel that, um, I feel that pain. Um, the CARES Act was implemented to hand out money on a first come first serve basis. And a result of that, as you point out, a lot of businesses and individuals may not have had the resources or the knowledge to get an application in. They may not have already banked with an approved SBA lender. Um, and so my takeaway from that is that now that they, you know, and, and I'll, I'll also mention in terms of implementation. So some of the smaller community banks um, were, were begging for guidance from treasury so that they wouldn't have to completely redo their approach to, to lending. Thankfully, that guidance came uh, late last week, but you know that 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 had an impact. That, those delays uh, had an impact. So, um, you know, one of my takeaways from this is one: uh, the program needs more funding. Um, I introduced a bill on Monday called the Paycheck Protection Program Expansion Act mm -hmm. to add a, an additional nine hundred billion dollars to that program. Um, on top of that, um, I, I personally, I think we need automatic triggers in all of these programs so that if, uh, again, to quote Jaws, we need a bigger boat, that that happens automatically rather than on waiting on uh, congressional negotiation to occur. You know, I've worked in yeah. economic development professionally for a decade. My observation is what employers want from government perhaps more than anything else is just an environment of trust and predictability. And, uh, you know, the worst thing that can happen in my view is for um, the government to say help is available. And then when someone knocks on the door for help that there's not, not help to be had. So um, on top of that, I think there is a desire to see um, more resources provided to entities that can help female and minority owned businesses and veteran owned businesses uh, access some of these funds better. There's been a push to provide at least some of the funding through community development financial institutions, CDFIs like Craft 3 in the state of Washington that have some experience doing things like micro lending uh, to you know, really much smaller businesses in hopes of helping them navigate this and get access to those resources too. So that's, um, uh, you know, I, 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 what I would say is um, uh, 
clearly there are some lessons learned from implementation of the CARES Act. Um, I'm eager to, to see um, things improve to get funds out the door in this next round. I would encourage folks on this call to prepare now for the upcoming infusion of additional funding to these programs. I was, when we were on hold and I put myself in on mute, I was texting with some colleagues. It sounds like they're, um, uh, that uh, the deal is, is near um, for uh, some additional funds to go into these programs. And I'm gonna keep working to ensure that we're um, ironing out the kinks on this so that uh, uh, the folks who need it are getting the help they need. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Um, I think that addresses uh, several of the questions that we've gotten. Um, on this topic, the, the concern, of course, will, will it run out of money? What happens if it does? And it sounds like there's an anticipation of like it, I think it was, it was a, maybe 200 was it 250 billion dollars? I don't remember what the number off the top of my head anymore. But what was the amount of money that was in the PPP? And it sounds like 900 billion is a heck of a lot larger. <laughs> yeah, three. It was initially 350 billion, and yeah. um, you know, frankly, both the PPP and the what's called the Economic Impact Disaster Loans. Um, both need a whole lot more uh, more funds. Yeah, for sure. Um, so th this tech tech community has a lot of startups in it, um, some of whom are are fairly young and don't have any record of um, documents from last year. So the question is, like, are they going to be applicable? And then related to that, uh, I'm, I'm I'm guessing you already know this, but I'll just bring it up anyway. There, there is an anomaly because the definition of affiliations um, in the SBA process that uh, essentially precludes not all but most VC funded tech companies because of the way that the accounting is done relative to funders having certain amount of a percentage ownership of the company and therefore other employees related to that so therefore they don't make the cutoff anymore. Um, and so uh, it seems like that wasn't by design. Uh, I don't think Congress was trying to cut out uh, venture capital back tech startups or raw startups, but any thought about where we go from here on that? Yeah, it, I mean, uh, obviously that's been a, a, um, a significant topic of conversation. Um, you know, I think the hope is that everyone who uh, is uh, in a small business, a small employer that is uh, seeking funding to weather the storm uh, is given resources to, to weather, uh, weather the storm. Um, you know, right now, uh, it's, it's the responsibility of the borrower to determine which, of, if any, um, are its affiliates and determine the employee headcount of the borrower and its affiliates, mm -hmm. you know, lend, um, so it's it's basically borrowers certifying their eligibility for for uh, for the program. Um, that needs clearly to be made clearer by by Treasury in this next round. Um, in terms of you said we have many young uh, uh, companies. My recollection yes. is um, you just have to have been in existence since I think February first uh, mm -hmm. to be able to apply for the PPP. Got it. Yeah, that, that's what I thought. Okay, that, that answers the question, please. Um, so uh, we've covered sort of the, the highlights of like what, how do, how do companies get support? How do em employees or former employees get support? Um, and you've, you've mentioned a couple of times that there's actions being taken by Congress uh, with respect to hospitals and the, the system that's being uh, supported to deal with the actual disease itself. I'm curious if you could just give us some highlights about, in addition to the work that you all are doing in Congress to try to help the economy through this, um, give us an idea about the federal actions, any other federal actions that you think we should know about relative to everything from PPE to hospital support to testing, tracing, et cetera. Yeah, anything all good, we should all good questions. So the, 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 the CARES Act really had five strategic goals and we talked about one of the big ones, which is providing relief to business. The biggest piece of that was the, the Paycheck Protection Program. You know, the second piece was relief to individuals, that pandemic unemployment insurance, the cash rebates that we talked about. There was also additional funding provided for uh, nutrition assistance and uh, for, for 
food banks. And in fact, yesterday I did a Facebook Live with the folks from Northwest Harvest because we're getting a lot of inquiries from folks who've said, gosh, I've never had to access food assistance before. How does that work exactly? The third tranche was relief to students uh, and, and educators. So right, uh, right, right. funding was provided to K-12 institutions um, to support uh, students and, and educators to provide more money and more flexibility for schools to provide meals. There's 22 million kids in our country um, who uh, depend on the free and reduced price lunch, lunch program to get a nutritious meal. Um, part of the CARES Act was also focused on, uh, on students in college. You know, there's a bunch of things that, frankly, I had never even thought of before. So, you know, before the passage of the CARES Act, I got a call from one of our community college presidents and said, okay, so I've got students who are on work study. Their work study job is a campus job. I just shut my campus. Who pays? He said, does the student pay or does the does my college pay or does the federal government pay? So one of the things that was in the CARES Act was to basically turn those work study funds into, into grants um, uh, while, while schools are, are suspended. You know, there's a deferral on student loans and interest payments through till um, the end of September. Uh, you know, students who drop out don't have to, um, it doesn't count against their lifetime limits on loans and, and Pell Grant eligibility and those sorts of things. And then um, there was also, uh, employers are now able to provide up to uh, I think it's $5,250 in tax-free student loan repayment benefits. So big chunk for students and educators. I think two areas that we didn't really talk about is one state and local government uh, support. So $150 billion was provided for states and tribes and local governments to help with recovery. Um, you know, obviously our states are I talked to the governor um, earlier this week, the state of Washington has already spent a billion dollars on personal protective oh, yeah. equipment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, not to mention the fact that we're seeing, you know, a real decimation of revenues coming into every uh, entity within um, government because, you know, the economy has basically been um, put into a virus induced coma. And yeah. We've got, we've got a, a tax code that's based on transactions, right? So exactly. Yeah, and, and that's, not, that's not really happening. And so, yeah. again, there was funding provided in the CARES Act for that purpose. Uh, it is very likely that far more funding will need to be uh, provided. Uh, you may have seen yesterday the governor of Ohio said that they're prepping 20% across the board cuts. You know, uh, obviously that is not great. Um, uh, you know, and you don't want to see um, the hit to our uh, economy um, lead to um, uh, massive reduction in, in services that are available to people who need it. So that's, um, that's part of this as well. And then the other piece of this is just funding for public health. So the, right. the CARES Act included $100 billion to hospitals and community health centers to um, help them in the prevention and diagnosis and treatment of COVID-19. Um, the bill also included expanding the availability of testing um, so that those who get a test, it doesn't come at a cost to them. Um, personally, I think uh, uh, the federal government should cover both testing and treatment as well. Mm -hmm. um, it set aside some funding for uh, veterans care. Um, I did a call with the secretary of the VA, you know, and obviously this is a challenge because we have a bunch of uh, veterans clinics and veterans hospitals uh, and veterans homes that are really challenged by this as well. And then, you know, the, really the area where I think the federal government has frankly not done uh, enough by far is we need um, far more, we need to massively ramp up testing capacity because the ability to, you know, kind of quote unquote, get the economy back to normal will be limited if people don't feel comfortable being in close proximity to their coworker or to their customers. And I was on a call this morning with the head of the Food and Drug Administration. You know, we have seen nowhere near the testing capacity that, that we need. Personally, I believe that the president needs to much more aggressively pull the lever on the Defense Production Act. You know, in the state of Washington, our rate limiting step uh, is um, 
uh, swabs. We don't have enough swabs to gather samples to jam up people's noses to get a sample to go to the testing labs. And so, you know, uh, we've seen similar problems around personal protective equipment. Uh, I'm a sponsor of a bill to put far more um, uh, uh, funding into the Defense Production Act and uh, pull that lever a lot harder. Um, thank you. I th there's one thing that you didn't mention that I'm, I'm getting, I'm hearing a lot of this uh, from business leaders that we speak to about how to go about operating in this environment and how to, I mean, the likelihood is that testing and tracing are not going to be available anytime soon. That PPE will continue to be difficult to acquire. So masks for all employees is going to be hard. Uh, so any, any scenario in which we start ramping the economy back up and people start so coming back to work, I'm not exactly sure what, if I believe anybody's timing on any of this stuff. I've heard something as early as late May, but I'm beginning to doubt that, even that here. Um, where I'm, what I'm hearing is the, is the number one driver of, of, of concern for business leaders, interestingly, isn't like how to go about doing that. It's related to the education comment that you made in that there's a really significant issue in the lack of um, childcare support for a very large percentage of the employees <laughs> who are currently working from home semi-productively um, because they're also homeschooling. Um, and if there is a work come back to work scenario in which there is still a lot of remote work required, yeah, there's got to be some way to support childcare through all that, and it just seems to not make the cut on any of these conversations. It's a it's a it's a fair point, um, uh, and will be a challenge when we hit June, anyhow, when schools would otherwise uh, be out. There is in the CARES Act substantial uh, funding uh, for the childcare uh, block grant program through the federal government. Um, to push a whole bunch of money into child care. You know, now some of that is stop the bleeding funding because child care facilities, like everybody else, have been hammered, uh, uh, hammered through this. But, um, uh, you know, in, uh, if we're going to, if we're going to get, you know, kind of the, um, the, the kind of get, get back to normal scenario, um, you know, a lot of the discussion right now around childcare has been focused on our first responders. You know, we've been mm -hmm. talking with boys and girls clubs, we've been um, talking with y YMCAs, um, but I think your point is very well taken and we've been um, very engaged on, okay, what is, that, what is that path and how do we yeah. ensure that there's more uh, federal support and future, future packages to get those childcare resources available. The other piece of this, you know, to, to, to the broader point is, I guess a, a couple things. One, as we roll out kind of a get to normal strategy, it clearly needs to be done in close consultation with our public health professionals. Because in my view, yep. the very worst thing that could happen is that we have to repeat this exercise again. You know, I don't want to see us get another spike in virus cases and then have to shut down the economy again. Um, so uh, we were, the Washington State delegation was on a call with. Uh, the head of the Department of Health yesterday and with uh, Admiral Bono, who's um, mm -hmm. kind of navigating mm -hmm. the state, the health responder piece of this. And um, it's a question that all of us have. Again, one of the most important components of this is going to be um, the availability of testing and contact tracing. Yeah, for sure. Right. So what you have in front of you is a very pragmatic audience, right? These are, these are people who have built and are running uh, technology startups. So number one thing that most technology startups think about is, can I make payroll? And number two after that is, can I ship the product on time? Otherwise yeah. I die. So it's a super pragmatic audience. Sure. Um, and the, the topic that keeps coming up, it's come up uh, today several times and I, I, I hear this a lot. Where the hell is the money coming from to pay for two, soon to be three plus trillion dollars worth of 
emergency emergency funding for all of this good stuff. So um, what's going to happen to taxes in the future? Um, our program's going to get cut. Like, how how do you reconcile three trillion dollars worth of stimulus? Well, um, you've seen both uh, a, a combination of through um, through legislation. Um, uh, pushing a whole bunch of money into the system. You've also seen uh, monetary action by the Fed to push more uh, mm -hmm. money into the system. And um, you, you're not wrong that the, you know, obviously there's concern about um, putting additional, uh, putting additional um, purchases on the federal credit card when the federal credit card is already um, pretty maxed yeah. out. Yeah. Having said that, if you talk to the most conservative uh, economist or the most liberal economist, um, they're all in agreement right now is that you don't really have a lot of options, that, uh, that the action that you've seen undertaken both by Congress uh, and by the Fed from a standpoint of monetary policy is actions that you simply have to take in the face of both the largest public health crisis in modern history and the uh, largest economic crisis since the Great Depression. Yeah. I think, you know, there's, there's concern because the federal government can run on a deficit. State governments don't, cities don't. And, you know, we, we're, we're hearing from city council, they want more money. Um, and ironic, ironically, maybe, maybe not ironically, maybe disingenuously, a number of the city council members are referring to this as an Amazon tax, when in fact it's, this new tax that's being proposed next week is actually on everybody and everything, which just seems crazy from a timing standpoint. But they've got a city tax. The, the state is clearly <laughs> clearly out of money. The budget that just got passed a few months ago got it's blown up and thrown out the window. And so it's a special session or not, something's got to be done from a state level. And the feds are, are investing significantly into our economy. Um, you know, there are many businesses who are saying, oh, dear God, what is this going to look like from a tax standpoint? Like, how, how are we ever going to be able to get through this? So our industry often gets treat, treated like a philanthropy, mm -hmm. right? As, as if we were all billionaires and every one of us was named Bill Gates. And we're not. Most of the people on this call and most people in this industry have more in common with dry cleaners and restaurants than they would do with Microsoft or Amazon. Um, they're, they're scraping by and they're, they're growing, they're building jobs, but they're not producing profits. If they're producing profit at all, it's not a lot. So what do you think we should be doing as an industry to help and support other than just show up as, I don't know, an ATM? I, I understand why you're asking the question and I, I, I certainly understand the, uh, the concern. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can say, um, you know, one of the challenges that, that you've seen, and it's an argument that I made when we saw the tax bill from a few years back that, you know, added another trillion dollars to the deficit. You know, un unfortunately, we have a history of, in our country, of um, too often acting pro-cyclically rather, rather than counter-cyclically. Mm -hmm. You know, the good news is the action you're seeing right now by Congress and by the Fed are at least counter cyclical, right? More money is getting pushed into the system when there's a depression. Providing a trillion dollar tax cut during um, a massive period of long term expansion, I would argue, was not sound policy. Uh, so um, I, I would say, at least in the near term, as we are navigating our way out of this uh, crisis. For the employers that are on the line, I don't think there's a clear and present danger of a massive uh, tax increase. I think people are conscious of the fact that we are um, going into a, a recession and um, taking actions either on the spending side by cutting critical services to people who are vulnerable or on the tax side uh, um, by um, making things more uncompetitive for uh, employers that are already struggling to keep their head above water doesn't make a lot of sense right now. Yep. When we are back to a period of expansion, uh, uh, you know, frankly, our nation will have to come to, come to terms with some of its long-term fiscal challenges. Um, and every think tank, every bipartisan 
nonpartisan group you talked to has basically concluded the same thing. This problem is too big to cut your way out of it, to tax your way out of it, or to depend on economic growth alone as a strategy out of it. You're going to have to have a comprehensive solution to address debt. Yep, for sure. And I, and I, you know, what, one more, one more version of this, just to make sure you heard it from the tech industry is that the, the PPP seems to be working for, you know, some companies, um, both large, large, very large companies are, are getting their checks and then tech startups are, are wondering whether there's any money left over or whether, whether they're even going to get through the gauntlet on this. You know, there, there, there's an example here in the Q and a of, uh, Chris's steakhouse getting a $10 million check from PPP last, I mean, like, is there any way of, of creating some sort of stack rank priority on the companies that, that are small to mid-sized businesses where most of the jobs are in this country that maybe they get some sort of timing priority or something along those lines? Well, then again, that's part of the discussion that's underway right now is to try to drive more resources to the to those who've been underserved. You know, I just yeah. got off the phone with the, the or off of Zoom uh, with a um, with the Jefferson County Chamber, and we know that in rural areas, as an example, um, uh, not enough not enough resources went um, went to to rural areas and to yeah underserved communities. Um, we are uh, in discussions on uh, potential legislation that would look at providing grant-based assistance to employers of 50 uh, employees or fewer, just direct dollars um, to help weather this. Because even with the PPP, um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of uncertainty, right? Yeah. The, the, right. And again, as a guy who worked in economic development professionally, what employers need from government is some semblance of trust and predictability. These are really uncertain times. And if some certainty, either through um, adding, um, clearly adding more funding into the PPP, um, trying to direct more resources to those who haven't been properly served by it in this first round, um, uh, and as I mentioned, using things like our CDFI network and others to, to direct resources to folks who need it. And then I think the PPP can and should be supplemented by direct grant-based assistance to, to really our smaller businesses, maybe those 50 and under. Yeah, great. Um, there's, a, there's a question about the uh, Telehealth Relief Act uh, from the FCC um, and it apparently, um, I just scanned it quickly it requires you to be a uh, rural telehealth provider. Um, and I'm wondering, does that, does that actually make sense given that telehealth seems, I mean, uh, the telehealth companies that I know of, and I'll, I know three, have gone from, uh, let's say, one or two people calling a day to 10,000 people calling a day or texting a day. There's mm -hmm. different technologies. I mean, th many people, this is the only way they're actually going to get to healthcare at all. Yeah. Um, is, is there an intent to make it about rural? Isn't it true for everybody? Well, so there's a couple of things at play here. One, uh, there's a reconsideration of how do uh, providers get reimbursed for providing telehealth? Two, how do you enable greater flexibility for the provision of telehealth? So for example, can it be a reimbursable event for a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner to provide uh, to telehealth where right now in some instances that's not considered reimbursable, that's dumb, that should be fixed. And then the third piece of it is how do you ensure access to telehealth services for folks who might not currently have it? And that's where particularly the discussion around rural access comes into play. You know, I'm a uh, co-sponsor of an effort to direct more funds urgently into addressing uh, access to broadband and uh, uh, you know I, I represent a district that is living the digital divide you know we're not that far away from Seattle uh, but our circumstances are very different you know we've got I talked to a Native American tribal leader in my district a year or so ago and he said I said how's it going he said you want the good news or the bad news I said tell me the good news he said every one of our high school seniors graduated this year and I said what's the bad news he said well the state of Washington is now requiring our students take the state mandated exam on the internet. He said, Derek, we don't have high speed internet. 
he said, you know, we, they did a sample test. It's one of those where you answer 10 questions and click next page. He said, we timed it. It took a minute and 44 seconds to get to the next page. He said, so that's not going to work. So we're going to end up busing our kids to another school that they've never been to for some of our kids to a town they've never been to. Um, you know, so these issues around access to internet get yep. beyond whether you can watch, you know, uh, Tiger King on Netflix. Um, <laughs> you know, they get at, you know, do, do you have economic opportunity and do you have educational opportunity? And unfortunately for too many people, the answer in our country is no. And that needs to be, you know, this crisis is amplifying that problem. Yeah. Yep, that's right. As it is amplifying this massive chasm between those of us that have, frankly, the privilege to be able to work from home and those of us who are making the food and delivering the food so that we can work from home. And there's yeah. a gigantic chasm in everything from economic benefit to access to health care to risk of contracting the disease. It's, a, it's, a, it's created a great deal of clarity. Um, and I, I don't envy you and your colleagues the, the job of trying to quickly resolve stuff um, you know, in a system with 500 or so people that have to more or less come to agreement on something other than what time it is. Um, I, uh, I, there's a few minutes left for uh, maybe one or two questions, and then I'm going to um, let Rodrigo uh, have the last word. So anybody um, in the audience that hasn't had their question answered, you can either do it through the Q&A mechanism or you can raise your hand. Um, and I'll give you a minute to decide whether or not you want to ask a direct question that hasn't been answered yet. Going once, going twice. Okay, Rodrigo, I'm gonna um, turn this over to you and let you uh, make sure you're off mute and uh, let you have the last word. Uh, thank you, uh, Congressman Kilmer, uh, for your time today. I really appreciate it personally, thank you. You bet, I'll put, if it's all right, sorry, Rodrigo, I'll put into the um, chat uh, where folks can um, find me. We've put up uh, on our page um, a whole bunch of resource guides for if you're trying to navigate unemployment or if you're trying to um, uh, access some of the small business assistance and all sorts of other things. So I'll put that into uh, the chat. And, uh, and it's also uh, uh, the method through which you can most easily reach me if you had a question that we didn't get to. Um, beyond that, let me just say thanks for having me. Um, I know this is a really challenging time. I hope people are hanging in there and weathering this. I know this is a really um, contagious uh, virus, according to the FDA administrator this morning, three times more contagious than the flu. But it's not the only thing that's contagious. Kindness is contagious and caring about each other is contagious. So thank you for that. And thank you for, um, for having me and for caring enough about the folks in this uh, effort to make sure they're getting access to good information. So thank you, Michael, and everybody thank else. You. Thank you. Rodrigo, over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Congressman Kilmer. Really appreciate the insight and the information. Michael, thank you for organizing this. You know, we are um, hugely uh, excited to be part of this. And to all the participants that dialed in today, thank you for, for joining. Uh, you know, now more than ever, uh, local business community needs our support, and companies like Comcast are doing what we can to help support the, 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 the right uh, organizations and be present where we need to be present. You know, one of the things that I want to highlight is our services are really have become uh, essential for home, especially our internet service. And we have over 4,000 men and women here in Washington that are working really hard to ensure that that network is, is helping both businesses and residences across our communities stay connected at this important time. A uh, couple of things that I want to highlight um, Congressman Kilmer talked a little bit about the digital divide. One of the things that we've been able to do over the course of the last few weeks is we have a, a low income program called Internet Essentials. It's available to eligible customers within our footprint. And we were able to put out there a, a program where we're providing the first two months for free. Um, so really excited that we're, we're able to partner with the right folks uh, to get that program out there on the residential front. We've, uh, lifted and paused the residential data cap so people can work and study and not have to worry about you know usage and, and utilization so that's in place uh, currently 
And then lastly, we, we made a contribution to the Seattle Business Stabil Stabilization Fund recently that is hopefully going to help you know, some of the business, some of which are on this call, hopefully have additional funding sources to get through this uh, difficult time. So thank you so much uh, for everybody. This has been incredibly uh, uh, helpful, hopefully, to, to everyone. And um, thank you, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Be well.